We're now going to introduce two seminal characters in the study of human development. They are both developmental psychologists, and they're actually born in the same year. And they present us with two very different frameworks for understanding human development. They are Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky. Here they are. They were both born in 1896. Piaget on the left in France and Vygotsky on the right in what was Russia and in his lifetime became the Soviet Union. Now Piaget lived a long life, was very productive, lived until the 1980s and contributed uh, greatly to the development of theories of cognitive development within the West. He was thus involved in the discussions around the emerging disciplines of cognitive psychology and the cognitive turn that we've identified. Vygotsky died young in 1934. He was only an active psychologist for a few years, but a very profound one. Uh, he was in some communication with Piaget. I don't believe they ever met. Um, but his work wasn't known in the West until about the 1970s. When work is done in languages other than English and French, it often takes a while to seep through. And in this respect, Vygotsky's works have um, been delayed in informing our understanding of development. But they are both now landmark figures. And the contrast that their frameworks exhibit um, can be understood with respect to their different social embeddings. So Piaget is growing up in France, in a highly individualist culture, as the West is. Um, he's there at the birth of cognitive psychology, in which um, the cognitive system of an individual is the particular focus. And his concern is with the development and maturation of change within an individual. So much as we plant a seed and expect it to grow into a sunflower, which will in turn generate more seeds. So for Piaget, the infant is born and has a sequence of stages it will go through on the way to being an adult. And those stages are strictly sequenced. With a sunflower, if I wish to generate more sunflower seeds from a sunflower seed, I plant the seed and I have to let it grow. I have to let the little leaves come up and then a stem come up and then a flower come up and then the flower has to be pollinated and then we get the seeds. You can't short circuit that. That notion of maturation with a preordained sequence of stages is the way Piaget approaches the individual. Vygotsky, as we'll see in the next video, um, comes from a very different worldview with very different ideologies. He is there at the birth of communism in the Soviet Union, and he understands the child to be principally socially constructed. And so he's um, extremely helpful in making us aware of the profound interactions between the developing child and caregivers and environment, material environment and social environment. We'll return to Vygotsky in the next lecture, but for now, let's have a look at Piaget. On his own words, he called himself a genetic epistemologist. Now, Piaget's notion of genes is now outdated. Um, so, But back when he was working, genes were at the forefront of biology, and they seemed to represent a storehouse of information about the developing individual, and the, the knowledge, capacities, skills, personality of the adult would be seen as emerging from their biological roots. As I said, genes are no longer treated in this simplistic fashion. So he's a genetic epistemologist looking at the development of a cognitive capacity as if it were like a flower, as if it were like a, the unfolding of a preordained biological process. He tried to trace the various stages in this, these steps in a preordained sequence, starting with the sensory motor activity of a young infant, all the way up to the ability to deal with complex abstract logical problems seen by him as a hallmark of a kind of an adulthood. 
and thereafter he's not really interested. So he he's, he follows his subjects from age zero to about 16, 15, 16, something like that. And importantly, uh, Piaget views humans as very, as driven by curiosity. He sees their exploratory activities as absolutely central to the process of development. They make meaning by interacting with the world. Um, this gives rise to one flavor of the notion of constructivism. Constructivism um, refers to a variety of theories. Here we're dealing with cognitive constructivism in which a cognitive system, an inner cognitive system, that will support one's knowledge of and interaction with the world is constructed actively by the developing subject. So the kind of questions that Piaget is asking is what's going on inside this little bugger? What changes are taking place inside the child? What's the sequence of things which must occur in a particular sequence? And some things maybe are can occur at any given time. So. Uh, language is learned at a specific time. We learn language, we start learning language very, very early, and we are language users by age two or three. As you know, that process is very different if you go to learn a language at your high old age. But other things might be excused from this sequence. So the ability to use a yo-yo can be acquired at any age. Um, it's not necessarily part of any biological sequence. So the, these, this cognitive constructivism that he's um, describing sees the child progress from simple concrete interactions with the world, very direct, very embedded, very local to the here and now, to complex, abstract, formal understanding. That, for Piaget, is the trajectory. And in this, he identifies four stages. Now, let's not take these stages as hard and fast with fixed boundaries, such that you go to bed in one stage and get up in another stage. Rather, these are an attempt to pick out the principal hallmarks that children go to over a range of years. Different children may be slightly different uh, in their timing, but not in their sequencing. And one purpose for these stages is to allow educators um, to ensure that the what they're asking of children is appropriate to their stage of development. So if we look at these four stages, the sensory motor stage from age zero to two years, this one actually has a boundary. This is the pre-linguistic child. We don't send such children to school, possibly play school, but that's just minding them. Um, the child is pre-linguistic and its engagements are entirely bodily with the world. The pre-operational stage from two to seven, this is the younger half of primary school. So the junior infant, senior infants in the first few years of primary school. At the pre-operational stage, there are certain things we can ask of the child and certain things we would prefer not to. The concrete operational stage moves one beyond this. This for us here would be the, the latter half of primary school. And the final stage, formal operational stage, comes with locally what we here see as the transition to secondary school and as you know the structure of your day in secondary school is very different the things that are asked of you is very different and um, so we have different syllabuses that are appropriate to support the child in their learning at these different stages for piaget there's a single underlying process going on here as the child explores its world as the child has experiences encounters things and overcomes problems it needs to adapt the world is always throwing up challenges and the child can uh, meet those challenges can fail at meeting those challenges can go and do something else but as it's adapting this the, the changes can be of two basic natures assimilation is the easier one assimilation is more like additive learning here a novel experience can be dealt with with the fundamental structures with which the child thinks and interacts with the world. So this is a matter of incorporating something new into pre-existing structures. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes the cognitive capacities themselves need to be reorganized. And this is what Piaget describes as accommodation. 
mental structures are adjusted based on novel experience. This doesn't necessarily happen overnight, but when we, for example, acquire the ability to count, we now engage with the world in a different way. We have new capacities that will help us to master new situations. Learning to count is not just assimilation, it requires accommodation. So let's just walk through those four stages to pick out their principal hallmarks. At the early pre-linguistic stage, which he calls the sensory motor stage, the interaction with the world is entirely with the whole body. Children are sticking things in their mouth. They explore the world with their mouth a lot. They play with things. Uh, so the emphasis is very much on that which is physically present right here, right now. And the child there playing with his toy truck. Um, at this early stage, children don't even have what's called object persistence. That is, they don't recognize that when something comes into view and goes out of view, that it still exists. That's why playing peekaboo is such pleasure with children at this age. It doesn't really work when you get a bit older. Moving now to the pre-operational stage, or as I've said, the, the first half of primary school. Object permanence is hopefully acquired or we'll never get our lunchbox back from school. Language use has started and the child is now starting to use symbols. Language use doesn't all happen overnight as well. We start interacting linguistically probably in, in the second year of life. But we go on learning our whole lives and learning a lot for at least the next 10 years or so. So symbol use needs to be practiced. Um, those of you who've interacted with young children at this age know that their thinking is rather fanciful and wishful and that they have a very limited understanding of what we understand to be uh, by way of temporal structures, days of the week, weekends, holidays, and so on. So you may have found yourself with a young nephew or niece trying to handle their expectations coming up to Christmas by using a formula like only three more sleeps till Christmas, only two more sleeps till Christmas. This kind of scaffolding is necessary because a projection forward of three days might as well be three years for a child at this stage. The reasoning that they're doing here is symbolic to some extent, but it's restricted to what's going on here now. So this child will happily talk about that fire truck. When children get towards the second half of primary school, their thinking becomes increasingly abstract and um, removable from the immediate context in which it occurs. I've illustrated that in this slide, the child playing with the truck <clears throat> is now aware that the truck is a member of a class, that there are other trucks, that it could have been a blue truck, a green truck, that there are fire trucks down in the firehouse. Um, they've learned a lot at this stage. The reasoning at this stage is often still supported by practical physical aids and we all go through this and we ne don't necessarily lose it. Some people like to still like to count on their fingers or use their finger to guide their eyes when they're reading a book. So the use of the whole body to support nominally abstract reasoning never really goes away, but it's that kind of physical scaffolding is very prominent at this stage. And as we move to the final stage, the formal operational stage, here we get uh, the kind of thinking that society demands when it requires of children that they learn mathematics, for example, uh, or science. So we get abstract reasoning about abstract concepts. Uh, and in this now, the cognitive world of the child has changed. It has assembled a set of resources that allow it to, for example, engage in hypothetical thinking, project into the future, uh, solve problems without any physical engagement with the world. And from Piaget's point of view, they're done then, they're baked, and they can go on and be adults. So this is Piaget's cognitive constructivism. The developing child is constructing meaning, literally constructing meaning, out of their engagement with the world. They are changed from these engagements, sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes without the need to radically uh, reorganize one's cognitive capacities, but sometimes with very profound changes. And notice what this does for the child. It grants a lot of dignity and respect to the child, and that the child is more than a mere recipient of information. The child here is not a vessel into which the world must pour knowledge. These children are sense makers. They are understood by Piaget to be sense makers. They are actively interpreting their worlds, driven by curiosity. 
Nothing can stop a child like this exploring its immediate environment and drawing consequences from it. So that's a brief view of Piaget. And in the next video, we'll contrast that with Lev Vygotsky.